Hi, everybody, and thank you for coming this Monday afternoon to our Atlas Speaker Series, generously supported by Edith Herrick Caperton and Anat Caperton. Um, Anat Harrell, I'm sorry. Caperton is her mother. This is a very good friend of mine, Renee Whitmire, who probably named most of the elephants actually here in Amboseli National Park, where Heather and I have done some research. Um, you find that the world of information and communication technologies gets very small very quickly. But this was in her past life with her husband, the elephant scientist. And do you recognize any of these like guys on the screen? No. All right, <laughs> you're just saying that so I be quiet. So Renee and I both kind of cut our teeth at the same time in ICTD research. She was one of the other kind of up and coming PhD students when we were all up and coming, all seven of us. Um, we've worked together at Microsoft Research Labs India. Um, Renee was at UC Berkeley working with the TIER program, which is sort of the eminent academic ICTD program for a long time. Um, probably even still, but we're, we're catching up every day. Um, and now Renee is at Intel Corporation where she worked at research on the emerging market side and is now running the corporate social responsibilities um, program worldwide. And so now, even though she lives in Fort Collins, we only see each other in New York and DC and Paris and other places, even though we're only an hour and a half apart. Um, the reason I really wanted Renee to come and talk is she's the author of kind of a groundbreaking report right now on uh, the status of women in broadband worldwide, you know, women on the web. And this was Intel's publication that came out in January to much acclaim and minor criticism, but only because they didn't write it. Um, and let's see, it was announced at our UN Women and State Department event, ooh, early January? Okay, so this report's been out for about six weeks. Uh, it's about the first time that anyone has tried to take a comprehensive view on broadband's impact and gender equity. And Renee is one of those very special people that can take research and make it very translatable and action-oriented for policymakers. So wanted to uh, make sure that we took advantage of you here. Okay. All yours. Okay. Thanks, Revy. Um, let me start, get my presentation up. So, as Revy mentioned, I work in the corporate responsibility part of Intel, and so as part of my role, I manage a number of our global relationships with what we call strategic alliances. So, organizations like USAID the State Department, um, UN Women, and the World Bank. Um, and then I also do a lot of strategy work in the context of our social innovation work and research. And this work, which, as Ravi mentioned, was released in early January, um, was part of that broader strategy around social innovation, and in particular, girls and women. So I wanted to start off um, my presentation with this quote, which was from the Clinton Global Initiative annual meeting in September. So it was on a panel with Chelsea Clinton, and the person said, we have access to thousands of bits of information, millions, but why memorize something that you can just look up in three seconds? No, you should know how to use that information. And that quote was by this young philosopher, Jack Andraka, who's 15 years old, and he was the winner of the Intel Science and Engineering Fair. This was his winning moment um, when he ran on stage. And he's also, at 15, a pancreatic cancer researcher. He developed a new screen for pancreatic cancer. And he's what I'm, we're calling the changing face of what's known as the knowledge gap. So I also want to introduce you to Beatrice, who is a woman from Uganda. And she's one of 12 children. She watched as seven brothers and two sisters died of HIV. Um, and she was at risk, as a result of that, of losing the land that she lived on. And Beatrice accessed the internet um, by walking four kilometers each day. So she would go to a nearby internet cafe and 
was use the internet to participate online um, with a global network of women, a, a group called World Pulse. And it's all about citizen journalism, telling your story and sharing that with other people. And Beatrice told us, you know, I used to be really shy, but now I just want to tell my story to anyone who will listen. And as a result of that, she had this tremendous outpouring of advice and information and strategies, in particular about how to keep her land. And Beatrice told us that, you know, now I have this army of women who are supporting me, and I can tell my story. And what happened was that she was also able to save her land. And then this face I want to just tell you about represents the 2,200 women that we surveyed in our Women in the Web report that I'm going to talk to you about today. And this face is many, represents many of the women that we talked to. And actually, there's many like her. One in, in our research, one in five women in India and Egypt told us that they thought it was inappropriate to access the internet. And if they did access it, that their families would not approve. And our report showed that nearly, there's basically nearly 25% fewer women than men online today in developing countries. And in places like sub-Saharan Africa, that number grows to almost 45% fewer men, uh, women than men. And this holds significant lost opportunities for women. Um, you know, and, and because women are critical collaborators in the development process you, and in achieving development goals, this results in lost opportunities not just for the woman, but for her families and her broader community. And she's also the, the changing face of this knowledge gap. So here you see three very different faces. Jack illustrates the wealth of opportunities and the positive impacts associated with accessing information and being able to use that for a benefit. Beatrice illustrates the struggle um, to get access to information and the benefits that can be derived once you do have that access. And here, this third face represents the many women and men um, around, the, around the globe who don't have access to much information and who don't see the benefits or opportunities that accessing that information can lead to. And this is by far the largest group of people on the globe. And so these, these three demonstrate that there's a serious knowledge divide and that you know, there's this gap in standards of living between those who can find, create, process, manage, disseminate information and those who are impaired in that process. And a recent UNESCO report showed a positive correlation between having access to information and power and income and wealth. And so as a result of this knowledge divide, there's also an unequal access to skills development, which means lost opportunities around education, um, achievement, as well as broader social and economic development. So I want to situate the, the report that I'm going to talk about within the larger context of information and communication technologies and development, ICTD. And I'm a social scientist by training, so I like to situate things um, within this, these contexts. Um, but as, as Revi mentioned, you know, there's just a diversity of actors in this space. So, you, in any kind of context or meeting or conference around ICTD, you'll find actors from USAID, Intel, Microsoft, academia, um, the nonprofit sector, foundations, and civil society. And my research when I was a doctoral student was really focused on understanding the model of development that, and the assumptions embedded in this whole field of information um, technologies and development. And there's really a very underlying principle of market-based development here, and a, a, huge, um, a huge number of private sector actors which see this space as you know, productive, 
and a place to, to see benefits for themselves as well. Um, and it was based, a lot of this was based in 2002, 2003 timeframe on this idea that there's a fortune at the bottom of the pyramid. And the bottom of the pyramid meaning the people in the world that live on less than $2 a day. And so part of my research has really been to think critically about that model and think about what are the assumptions that are embedded when you think about the poor as a consumer market. Um, the idea was that if you invest as a private corporation into the poor, um, whether that's providing them with health care or with shampoo bottles, um, rather than big bottles of shampoo, little sachets of shampoo. That's the model of the bottom of the pyramid that everyone loves to talk about. Um, this could result in not only profits for yourself, but for social benefits and health benefits for the poor. Um, and so I kind of thought about that in a very critical way during my, my dissertation work and looked at how does that actually play out in practice. And as a practitioner now in that space and working for a corporation, it's something that I think about very much in the way that my team approaches some of the social innovation work and how we think about emerging markets. Um, also part of this ICTD space is you know, a huge influx of different actors like engineers and computer scientists and a few social scientists um, thinking about technology solutions. So you know, how can we actually deploy something? And that again drives a particular type of development. Um, as you're kind of testing and piloting and working with partners who also want to do that. So it's, it's really a space of innovation, but it's a space, to, as you know, from my lens, that we should all think about very critically and really think about how, are, how is this space being defined? How are we as different actors, whether it's in the private sector, whether it's in academia, think about ourselves in relation to who we're trying to target, whether that's the poor um, or who the beneficiaries are. So there's a burgeoning field of research. Atlas is doing tons of work in this space, so it's, it's great to be here and participate in this forum. So then, the, just to kind of broaden that, so now thinking about ICTD and women in particular, this is another space that's very incredibly diverse in terms of the types of activities that happen in this space. And so, People think about this often as kind of bringing a, folk, a gendered focus to technology efforts, as well as using technologies to benefit gender initiatives. And gender and women are always used interchangeably in this space. Um, and just, again, to situate from like a social science perspective, gen that's not necessarily equivalent. And so it, when I think about gender, I think about it in a very relational way. So in relation to men. Um, and that's often absent in the way people talk about women and technologies and all that stuff. Um, so I was, in the particular this report, I'm focused on the, the first point, access and gender parity. So how are men and women accessing technologies? How are they using it? Um, but there's so much other work. Uh, Revy and I were in DC in early January with this big, this global working group on technologies and development, and people were talking specifically about women um, in the context of digital literacy, in the context of health, education, political participation, as well as STEM. So, you know, how do we get more women involved in STEM careers? And NC Wit does an amazing job in this space. But there's so much diversity. It's kind of important from, from my perspective to really hone in on, on what specific aspects we're looking at. So a new concept kind of evolved from the whole model of public-private partnerships and ICTs and development. And that's really this concept of shared value. And similarly, in you know 2003, everyone thought about the bottom of the pyramid. It's the great new thing. And, and similarly, now shared value has taken the eye of corporations and, and development agencies as well as the space of how can we create social impact as well as create value for businesses. Um, and, it's a, and so it's a, Michael Porter from Harvard put out this, this paper a few years ago and 
we've at Intel have been working with Michael Porter um, to think about take how can we use this concept of shared value seriously. So it's we're not just doing corporate social responsibility, which is often seen as this nice to have thing that corporations do, but instead, how can you take your core business and think about what are the opportunities from the social space that can drive business value? And it's just shifting the conversation a bit. Um, but it has implications for how much a business may want to engage. And, it, and you know, thinking about internal to Intel, having those conversations changes the way that I can engage with the business units. Because they're thinking, you're not just a cost center. You're actually creating value for the company. And that's in terms of dollars and business value. So when we're thinking about the, the girls and women space from Intel, it seems like there's a potential to create shared value in this space. And in particular, with this report, creating shared value by bridging that internet and gender gap. So to give you a little bit of context about what does Intel do, why do we even care about girls and women? Um, so we have a whole strategy around girls and women from the corporate responsibility side as well as from the business side. So from the corporate responsibility side, um, it's really about thinking about digital inclusion, so increasing access to technologies. This report falls squarely in that space. Um, thinking about 21st century learning skills. So how can we expand the quality of technologies through education and teaching? And so we have a number of programs called Intel Learn, Intel Teach, that works with teachers and students in the classrooms to use technologies meaningfully um, as tools versus kind of creating a computer lab, setting it up, and you know not really having an agenda about that. So that's another space. And then the third is really developing technology solutions. And that's really the social innovation space. Um, and how can we address girls and women in that through social innovation solutions? Uh, from a motivation perspective, you know, we've, we had been working in this space and really seeing all of the actors from the State Department to UN Women talking about the fact that women and girls don't have equitable access to the internet. Um, but there wasn't any global data to quantify that. And so we really wanted to understand, you know, what are, what, first of all, what is that gap? And second of all, what can closing the gap do? And so we were really looking at the results of that internet gap um, around women's income and income potential, women's sense of empowerment, um, women's sense of equity, as well as what are the market opportunities that are associated with closing that gap. And then also from a macroeconomic perspective, what does that mean? So here I wanted to just give you some context to global internet access. So there's 2.4 billion internet users around the world, and that access is not equally dispersed. So you can see, for example, giving, just to give you some um, country-specific data, in Uganda, there's 13% internet penetration in the country. In India, there's 11% internet penetration. And in places like Iceland, there's 97% internet penetration. So there's huge variation among countries. And in the United States, there's 78% internet penetration. And of those, of this, um, of the, because this is a global perspective, of the 2.4 billion internet users, 1.4 billion are in the developing world. And so here's some more kind of understanding of, of drivers of internet users and growth. So over the, the next three years in developing countries, there's, there's more and more users that are set to come online, just as a result of organic growth. And that's really because of improved infrastructure in these countries, um, the proliferation of access platforms with a number of different types of access points whether that's via a tablet, a phone, a computer, and a desktop. New technologies create these different opportunities to access the um, internet. 
Um, affordability, the price is just going down, so it's becoming more and more affordable to use the internet and it's various business models, whether it's like a prepaid model. Um, and you know, for, for me, I lived in Kenya for many years in a very rural area and almost all of my friends there are on Facebook through various ways. So whether it's a very, it's called Facebook Zero on phones, um, and they're updating their status. So it's just interesting how over time these, who's accessing it and how is changing. And then there's just increased public support for accessing the internet. So similarly, if you think about women in particular, those drivers of overall internet growth are also fueling the online participation of women. So from an infrastructure perspective, you know, there's this increased access to 3G all over the world. Um, only 1% of the women that we interviewed said that coverage was an issue for them. Um, and then pl access platforms. So this was interesting in our research because now there's these more flexible internet platforms like smartphones and tablets. And, and one of the things that we found in our research was that there were challenges for women to access the internet because of things like privacy. They didn't want to do to access technologies in front of other people because they thought that someone would see what they were talking about. And so now with smartphones and tablets, you can go into another room. You're not on a desktop in your living room where everyone can see what you're doing. Um, affordability is another one. The, and what we found in our research was women often access the internet via shared access, so they're, they're not paying for their own internet. And then public sector initiatives, there's just tons of really innovative work going on in this space, um, specifically targeted at women. And so as I mentioned earlier, there's this, this gap. So that's what we were really trying to understand. So 23% fewer women than men. And that's, that represents 200 million few, uh, fewer women than men. So as I said, there's 1.4 billion internet users in developing countries. Of that, 800 million are men and 600 million are women. So there's that gap of 200 million people. And you can see the variation among the different geographical regions. And so if internet usage increases at the same rate for both women and men in the next three years, this gap will balloon from 200 million women right now to 350 million women over the next three years. And so that's if there's no concerted, concerted effort to try to change that. So what are some of the factors that are keeping women offline? So we looked at this from an individual level as well as an ecosystem or macro level. And so what we found at an individual level was that awareness was a key factor. And so awareness meaning knowing what is on the internet and knowing how it's relevant and useful. And what we found was that a quarter of the women that we interviewed that were not users indicated a simple lack of interest. Um, and a, a quarter of the women that we interviewed who are not online also just indicated they don't need it. It's not, not relevant to them. Um, and then in terms of ability, we found that familiarity with the internet and ability to actually use it and derive benefits from it was another factor that influenced whether people were online. So 40% of the women um, who were not using it la just cited that they just had a lack of familiarity. They didn't know what, how to use it or how, what digital skills would be necessary to use it. And then the environment was another uh, micro level factor. So things like gender-based um, norms and cultural norms. And so this idea that you know, one in five women thought it was inappropriate to use the internet and if they did, their families would not approve. That was very real, and I, I have a slide, the next slide with some quotes from women um, about that. Hold on one second. And then at a, at a macro level, you know, what are the factors influencing internet use? I think the two key things there at a macro level are affordability, 
of access. So, you know, if we can make the price effective for women, um, as well as simply coverage. Those are the two key macro factors influencing women. From the benefits side and the results side, things like um, esteem and expression. So a lot of the women that we talked to thought, you know, a key benefit was increased self-confidence, um, the ability to voice one story like Beatrice, this idea that she had this army of women supporting her who were outside of her network. Um, and then opportunities, whether that's economic opportunities, opportunities to around education, um, increasing entrepreneurship, all of those kinds of opportunities were seen as benefits. And then this idea of knowledge and networks, being able to communicate with people outside of your local community. And that held a huge importance for many of the women that we interviewed. And then at a macro level, there's just macro level economic development benefits. And so what we found was that if, if we were to increase the number of women online in the next three years, that would lead to vast GDP benefits ranging in the, the range of $13 billion to $18 billion annually across 144 countries. So it's Tremendous benefit at a, at a macroeconomic level. And so I just wanted to spend one moment talking about some of these quotes because we did, we surveyed 2,200 women. We did in-depth interviews with many of them. And it was just the quotes that kind of gave some life to some of our data. And, you know, it was things like, because of the internet, I feel more confident. Um, Internet is not appropriate for me. For me, it's not needed. That's my parents' thinking. And then also this idea, we, we interviewed many experts as well. Um, what is often perceived as technophobia in reality results primarily from gender norms and unequal opportunities. So interesting, we found that the longer um, that the internet has been available in a region, the more likely women were to use it for quote unquote productive uses. So things like work and for education, um, in addition to social networking and gaming. And so this is the slide, you know, thinking about shared value that I can show internally to my business units at Intel and say, hey, look, this is actually a huge market opportunity that we need to think about. And as a result of thinking about it, it can have all of these other benefits that can have this social benefits. And so we calculated that, you know, by doubling that number of women online could create this massive market opportunity in terms of data and devices. Um, and that's something as, you know, I've done versions of this talk for the business units at Intel to really think about what can we do together to, to close this gender gap and think, you know, get people to sit up and say, think about it seriously from a market perspective, but also as we're doing, you know, a lot of our markets are education markets, so working with schools, working with teachers, um, thinking about emerging markets and content bundles and how to think about first-time buyers of technologies. How do you attract women in particular? Um, and not just by, and I've been doing this for now five years at Intel, not just making a pink computer, because that idea has been floated many times. Um, thinking about it a little bit more seriously than that. And so, you know, there's, we found, the, we focused on four specific countries, um, Mexico, India, Uganda, and Egypt, um, in the terms of our 2200 surveys. And then we also used global databases, the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union data, which is very global data set, um, to make some of these assessments. But I, what I found was interesting was just the differences amongst countries. And specifically on this slide, to what extent does the internet give me greater freedom? In Egypt, 68% of our respondents you know, thought that that, was, that described it very well. And it was in particular, this, this research happened 
you know, over this period of time where there's massive political change in a place like Egypt. Um, other things that came out was about human rights. How do you think that the internet should be a human right? Um, and many women, you know, again, thought that was a, a key thing for them. So the report really has this call to action. How can we double the number of women online? And can we do this uh, through this multi-stakeholder effort and initiative? And so, so right now, 20% of women are online in developing countries. And the idea is to make that 40% in three years. And there's an organic growth of women who will come online regardless because of all of those drivers that I talked about. But our goal is to actually get that incremental segment of women to come online as well. And we think that we can do this by working with um, the pro you know, policymakers, civil society, governments, other private sector actors, as well as development agents. And by doing that, it would really make the internet more accessible, uh, more affordable, more convenient, secure, and engaging for women. And so our, our report really has a number of policy recommendations and recommendations for a number of actors. And the idea is that each actor really takes on what would be leveraging their respective strengths and what would be leveraging their interests, um, whether that's from the private sector, thinking about products and affordability of, of products, um, to you know, gender responsive outreach. And so some of these are some of the recommendations that came out of the report. So one big thing was about relevant content. A lot of the women talked about the fact that there just isn't that local language content um, outside of the, the main languages around the world. Um, that you know, content is expensive. And things like ability. So that's the space that Intel does a lot, is in digital literacy. Um, so we have a number of programs focused on getting women to really understand how to use technologies, and not just from a here's how you turn on a computer type perspective, but how do you use it meaningfully in your life? How can it be relevant to you? So that there's more than just that initial introduction, but something that will encourage you to use the internet on an ongoing basis. Um, from the environment's perspective, really thinking about addressing gender inequality and the underlying barriers to access. Um, safety was a, a big issue. So being able to go to an internet access point where you feel safe, you feel comfortable, you feel that it's appropriate for you to go there, um, that you won't get chastised for being there. And then at a policy level, you know, gendered national plans for broadband penetration. Thinking about how do we think about broadband plans and incorporate that gendered aspect into it, incorporate women as decision makers at the table. Um, and then addressing market constraints. Thinking about how do we make things more affordable at, at a, and also from a national perspective, what should be the policies around that. So I want to take a minute to just kind of, and so that's kind of the outline of, of what our report was, what the findings were. But I want to take a minute to kind of think, as a social scientist, reflexively about the report and what we found. And you know, we were really using these, we did the 2200 surveys, so that was primary research with these women. Um, but we used global data sets to make some of these aggregate numbers of, of sizing the gender gap. And with, with the use of global data, there's always issues around quality of data and the variation of that data among different countries and the data collection process. Um, so we're cognizant of that. And we recognize also that there's also local efforts to collect this type of data. Um, at a much more in-depth perspective. But then again, you run into the challenge, well, how do we generalize that to a broader set so we can put a stake in the ground and start painting a picture of what's going on? Um, and so then also from the shared value perspective, the public-private partnership perspective, there's always critiques. This is just privatization. 
you know, as, as a, a researcher doing work on public-private partnerships, that always came up about, you know, is, is e-governance in India the privatization of the public services? Um, so I would always think about that as well as we're thinking about, you know, how are these different actors getting involved and what's their stake in this? And I think shared value is a useful concept to really engage people in a way that they may not have had interest in this space before and to frame what we're talking about in a way that's understandable um, to private sector interests as well as business interests. And then the quantitative, qualitative on ongoing issue um, of, you know, we, we had some of these in-depth interviews. Um, could we have done more? I'm, I'm, I am full of angst, you can tell. I'm always thinking about this stuff. Um, and then also the power dynamics of, you know, what has been awesome is that this report in the course of six weeks, Ravi mentioned, has had international press coverage. So it's been cited at the World Economic Forum, on gender panels at the Clinton Global Initiative meeting last week. And there's all these power dynamics about, you know, it's coming from a big corporation, which has a big footprint around the world. And which is great because you can have that that impact in terms of trying to catalyze action. But for me, I want always try to think about you know, what's not being said and what research can we use this as a platform to catalyze as well. And there's clearly a lot of research that needs to be done in this space. Um, so how can we use this to get some visibility to some of those country level research sites and country level data sets that don't ha necessarily have the pull of you know, a multinational corporation. Um, and then also just thinking about the assumptions embedded in this, the accessing the internet. It's, you know, I've talked about the transformative power of the internet and the benefits that can be achieved. However, there's that dark side to the internet too, which is, again is why we're talking about not necessarily just giving people access, but making access a really quality experience and making it safe and making it secure because you know many of the women that we talk to talk about the reason their families think it's inappropriate is because they're scared they think that they will be their their family members will encounter predators and and all of that on the internet and that there's information that shouldn't be seen so there's all those tensions around what's appropriate and how to make an experience on the internet positive um, and useful for people and then I already talked about the relational view of gender. <laughs> um, so in terms of next steps, what we're doing is collaborating with stakeholders to take action. And basically, I'm working with the, the UN Broadband Commission, which is on gender. Um, they have a gender and ICT working group. And really getting them to think about taking on this meta goal for themselves, because we really need an international organization to take that on and to drive it versus one corporation or one organization. So think about a multi-stakeholder effort and how they can incorporate our goals into it. And then I'm also working with Intel's business units and thinking about how can we think about this for business? Do we need to develop um, new types of content? Do we need to think about marketing to women differently? Do we need to make um, our messages to first-time buyers specific to women. Um, and then just catalyzing action. So programs, partnerships with UN Women, partnerships with the State Department, um, and then we're engaging academics um, like Atlas, like UC Berkeley on doing more research in this space. So, you know, as we look at these three faces, you see these vast differences in terms of access to an ability to find and create and use information and apply that to your life. Um, and I see these daunting disparities. But I also see these three faces of opportunity, um, especially because this is clearly an unparalleled time of rapid innovation and rapid change. And never before has the world been so well situated to start trying to equalize the playing field and getting people 
to different people from different types of socioeconomic backgrounds to apply information and acts and what the internet can bring to their lives. And so join us. So join, you know, join this, this call to action um, and to, to catalyze action in this space. And if we could double the number of women online, that would lead to 40% of women in developing countries online um, in three years. And again, would have you know, those benefits, not just for the women themselves, but for their communities and broader society. So does it, are there any questions? I'm going to just leave it at that. Um, well, so there's this big, there's, it's kind of like the shiny new object that mobiles for development is the new space to be in. So you should create mobile learning platforms, e-learning platforms, anything with a mobile device, particularly a phone, and oftentimes a feature phone because that's what's most ubiquitous in the world. Um, and I think that there's, a, as always, there's a ton of hype around that space, and what we looked at in this particular um, report was we took the approach of looking at multiple platforms. And what we found was that actually women found, um, you know, we looked at mobile only internet users and we looked at multiple platform internet users. And what we found through our research was that the women who were using the multiple platforms found more benefits from the internet versus the mobile only versus the kind of desktop, laptop only. And so I think it's just more productive to think about what's called the compute continuum and think about how devices interact um, versus kind of thinking about this, this new mobile platform only. Because it's just the, the context varies differently. Right, so we actually have a friend who's done a bunch of um, text-free user interface type research. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so there's, there's a, I mean, there's, there's a, some issues, because I think to be illiterate, you don't need, need to be literate. And my two-year-old is a, an, a, a testimony to that, because he can, he's, can use an iPad and get all over that all by himself. Um, but there's a bunch of initiatives for, at least in the, in the early education space, for that, that are kind of mapping those same skills to illiterate populations in developing countries. So whatever can be text-free and using symbols and all that kind of stuff. We looked at, so we looked at two things, was access and usage. So I didn't get too much into it. Um, but we were looking at the number of different kinds of usages beyond just social networking, which was the main usage, um, and gaming, which is also in, in a, a huge usage. The key areas that we found that women talked about in terms of usage was education. And it came out again and again that the content that 
people wanted to use and the purposes that they wanted to apply it to were around the broad topic of education. And so we delved into what specifically that looked like. Um, but I think that that point about you know, sex trafficking, all that stuff, that safety is a really important issue that really needs to be thought through carefully by the, you know, the various stakeholders like UN Women and all these groups that are working in this space. So in so Latin America had the sh the smallest gap. They've been on the regionally has been on the internet for the longest time, and their um, their kind of literacy rates and and education rates are higher than a, some of the other countries. So that just was a clear map. Um, and then in sub-Saharan Africa, some of the the education rates for girls are the lowest as well. Um, but we didn't explicitly look at that, but it was just kind of obvious from how the data fell. Um, so I, when I was doing my um, doctoral research at Berkeley, I was I did a number of internships as a grad student, and so I did an internship at Microsoft Research in India, and that was my first experience with the corporate world at all, um, and and it's kind of an anomaly. It doesn't feel very. It feels it does a lot of just field work on whatever you're doing. It was kind of an extension, and there's two ex-Microsoft research interns here as well. Um, but so that was the kind of the way I got into the, the space. I was already doing the research in this field. And then when I was doing my, um, and it was interesting because the private sector at that time in 2004 or 5 time frame were some of the only other groups outside of academia that was doing research in this space. <coughs> so it was it was kind of a natural fit to kind of work with some of them. And then Intel Labs hired me right out of my PhD. And I did a, an internship with them as well. <coughs> so we worked with um, a global group called Globe scan, and they have um, basically they did all of our surveys for us, and they have field offices in a number of different countries, um, and they worked with a number of organizations to kind of get a sense of where would they want to do the research, how would they want to sample. They did it all every. It was totally different per country, um, the partners that they used, and basically how they got to their samples. So I think my class reads your seminal work on teleceptors. Um, oh, wait, so I think I'll remember that. Um, and this is from your kind of groundbreaking research at the time. You talked about internet cafes. Um, what's your take on the future of you know, public access computing? And it's a little different from just a mobile kind of thing, but you know, is it a space that can be Um, so, I, so for my research, I did I studied tel centers in uh, a couple different states in India, and one of those initiatives was called the Akshaya Initiative, and it was basically entrepreneur-owned telecenters um, that the entrepreneur basically set the tone. And so, what I found was that when uh, set the tone of what the telecenter environment was like, and I found that when the entrepreneurs were women 
it changed the atmosphere for the women who came to their um, centers. And in particular, I did in-depth ethnographic research with these different entrepreneurs. So I lived with an entrepreneur for you know, several weeks, a female entrepreneur, and just saw her strategies of how she attracted both men and women. Um, but she made these special outreach things to, you know, to get women to, to actually do, to look up things for them, um, to make them realize that it's, you know, they can get what benefit they want by coming to the telecenter. Um, but I think that's not the norm at all. And in India, they just passed a national initiative to, so that one person from every household in the country will be illiterate. Um, and so there will be a lot of shared access computing going on. And so it'll be interesting to, to see how that evolves from a gender perspective. Yeah, so I mean, I think that, so in this, we definitely did not. Um, but in some of the ethnographic research that I've read and also done some, um, is part of that, it's not necessarily getting a baseline, but it's getting that understanding beyond this development intervention itself and situating that within the societal, you know, cultural norms and practices um, whether that's communicative practices. You know, what we found in Kerala a lot was around the use of radio um, for, com for just information dissemination. Um, and so really understanding as technologies evolve, how are those practices changing? But that, again, is not the norm <laughs> for, for the most part. Yeah, so it was, um, so the def definition of internet use was something that we went back and forth with for a lot on how we wanted to define it for our study. We didn't go, uh, the, the youngest, I think the women in our, who were surveyed were around 16. Um, so it wasn't younger than that. But it was, you know, using the internet um, might have been, I can't remember the exact definition, but it was multiple times in one month. Um, and it was just basically to have a definition so that we could then use that to define what we were saying. Right. Yeah, so the tech sector is um, not so great in the gender parity space, um, particularly because of the number of engineers that Intel employs. And there's, um, you know, I'm sure most of you know that there's just a, you know, getting women into the STEM space is difficult. And so there's a number of activities internally focused on, one is just retaining the women that we do have. Um, and there's a lot of focus on mentoring internally, and particular mid-career women, because that's a point where a lot of women leave the tech sector, um, because it often maps to you know, children and other life changes. Um, and then I think I would say, so I'd say that the kind of mentoring and retention issues are a big focus for Intel. And then also a big focus on just focusing on the STEM pipeline. So getting more women into the technical pipeline is a key priority for the business.
Um, well, so at, at UC Berkeley, they actually just got this massive um, USAID grant <laughs> to, uh, to, de to develop the field of development engineering. And so what's great about that, even though you guys didn't get it, is that it's just a more of a, an emphasis on the field and creating that kind of academic standards of what defines that field. Um, journals and kind of pushing, building the community. Because there's definitely a community that exists, but it's very fragmented. And so I think that that field will continue to grow. And this is one kind of major push in, into the right direction. Very cool. That's optimistic note. Uh, let's thank Renee for her. Thank you. Thank you.